Hi, everyone. I'm Natarajan Krishnaswamy. I'm an open data ambassador. And I got into open data, I guess. There was this talk at the Museum of Mathematics where Jen Chase, she was the head of Microsoft Research Northeast, and now she's dean at Berkeley. And she was talking about how they could find drug, like, drug discovery targets, uh, signaling pathways, proteins, and things like that were neither overexpressed nor underexpressed. But if you target them with drugs, you can stop cancer growth, kill cancer cells, stuff like that. And the fact that you could figure this out just from data is just utterly magical. So I, got, I then I decided to get a master's in data science, did that, and started volunteering around the same time. It's been quite a journey. Love it. Love open data. I love sharing the passion for like community empowerment through open data, stuff like that. So it's, it's very exciting to see such a full room today. So thanks everyone for attending. My name is Laura Hecklinger. I'm another open data ambassador. Um, this is my first year being an open data ambassador. I work for the MTA doing data management and volunteer here on the side. And yeah, I'm excited to work with everyone. I think open data is amazing, but it's really only as powerful if people know how to use it and utilize it and access it. So and know I'm it exists. And know it exists. That's <laughs> God, number one, know that it exists. So I'm excited to share all of that with y'all today. The Open Data Ambassador Program started in the run-up to Census 2020, a partnership between the Queens Public Library, Beta NYC, whom we all know, the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, build up data literacy, awareness of open data, specifically New York City open data, and also to drum up interest in the census to increase participation in census 2020, this Queens has had the most hard to reach, hard to count communities in the country uh, here where we, it, it's frustrating that we have that problem, but uh, yeah, but you may have heard that like New York city response rates were pretty high. We, uh, like in fact, increased our population by almost a million people. So it's uh, a fairly successful census that so we're not going to take credit for that, but it didn't. So the the program has continued they devolved it's a uh, train the trainers kind of program so they actually had presented the almost these same slides to us and we had practice sessions presenting them to each other and to some of the organizers and hopefully you all will be comfortable enough to do the same we'll share the slides after the event so that's the open data ambassador program i mentioned the parties that created it they, like I said, the original one also had uh, Queens Public Library, and uh, this one has expanded this. So New York City Open Data is a, like you, you heard maybe during the uh, keynotes that it's a, a program to make information about the operation of the city automatically available. And it's interesting to see how we got there. It's a transparency initiative in a lot of ways, as well as being something functional and usable. And a lot of uh, it's, I guess, in the same lineage as efforts like progressive era reforms after Tammany Hall and uh, Boss Tweed and uh, a lot of very public corruption to let people see what the government's actually doing. The city record, which nowadays is online at the link at the bottom, it lists like basically every like significant public act from hiring to bills that the city does. It was a big change to have all of that be public. These have been like the early paper ones have been scanned, but like I said, nowadays it's available online. The next really big jump was rather than you see what the government wants to tell you, uh, you can request information and they have to give it to you unless they have a good reason not to. And that started as Freedom of Information Act in the US in I believe 67 and various states, including New York State, passed their own versions. Some are called like sunlight laws, like in Florida or but here it's the Freedom of Information Law, or FOIL, and it was originally passed in 1974. It was completely replaced in 77 and has been amended uh, on and off through the years. I think the latest was in 2008. Not only do they generally have to provide requested information, they have to give you a reason if they refuse. And there are a number of statutorily permitted reasons. They may redact the information and stuff like that. But one kind of interesting thing that came out recently-ish was the... Uh, FBI had sent a letter encouraging Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to commit suicide. <laughs> Hoover's FBI was quite a thing. Yeah, so that's one of the things that FOIA has made possible. In New York State, like I requested some records from the DMV about uh, gender marker changes, which is pretty fascinating too. So 
the problem, it was a huge step forward, but it was still on an as requested basis. Individuals could request information from the government and it would be provided to them. So but the problem was uh, you had to know what you were looking for. You had roughly, you have to describe the records you're requesting. Generally, there are Agencies are not required to pr produce new records. They don't have to, for example, have an analyst do some new aggregations or calculations on your behalf. It's only stuff that's already been produced or is easy for them to give you. And that really only helps if you know what they have. New York City uh, made this a lot easier for people starting in 93 by publishing a directory of what uh, data sets each agency has and who to contact to find out more about it. And so that was a big step forward, but it's still in the FOIL, FOIA framework. You ask for data, you get it. And the huge shift happened uh, thanks to a lot of advocacy by a lot of different community and government actors to switch to a model of public by default. Each agency in the New York City government is obliged to publish their records that conform to the open data definition, uh, which we can talk about a, a little later, omitting things like personal information, private information about people, stuff like that in certain, most circumstances, that and make them like publicly available to everyone on the web. And that's the, the U.S. government has done something similar. Many localities and states do this, but a lot of the time it's via executive orders or policies. New York City is a little unusual in that it's actually the law, so it's not subject to the whims of administrations. The actual text of it is uh, Title 23, Chapter 5, if you want to look that up. Uh, you can find that in the New York City Administrative Code, which has all of amendments applied as like single current uh, administrative code text. So what does this mean? What is an agency, like what, how does this kind of mosaic or tessellate across the actual physical city, the people in it, the flows of information, goods, money? It's quite a thing. If you think about it, it's like, what is a city? A city is like this incredible complex system and a city government is a s interesting, like, rich subsystem of it with a lot of its own functional subsystems. So here we see Department of Sanitation, we see transportation, we see buildings, uh, taxi and limousine commission. Each of these have, as part of their operation, they consume data and they produce data. And it's not necessarily what they're for, but it's like the grease or the exhaust even in some cases. And it tells you what is, in, it gives you a view of what is happening in the city. It gives you a view of what is happening in each of these agencies. And it's possible to have some really exciting combinations of those. I had mentioned before that like something has, like. The things that agencies have to make public are open data as uh, under the open data laws definition. And one of the big important, like fundamental building blocks there is that the information has to be machine readable to start with. But what does that mean? It doesn't mean, it means not things like historical maps, even if they're interesting. Even if you scan the sort of thing that is, falls under the definition tends to be more like tabular data. If it has geographic information, it has to be stored in some ways like a, uh, if you're familiar with GIS systems, as like a geographic record in a table. So uh, it can't be like certain kinds of private and confidential. It can't uh, release things that are not legally public, that are not required to be kept confidential. And this isn't always what you'd expect because as the example here shows, every city employee's salary is public information. It includes their name, their job, the agency they work for, and their salary, among other columns, 17 <laughs> columns altogether. You can download this, you can look at it, you can see how it changes for an individual employee year on year. So. It's tying back to that very first transparency in the face of kind of corruption ethos that open data inherits from. The idea that you should be able to see what any public official is paid is like very much in line with that like progressive transparency. I'd mentioned these are made publicly available. There's a data platform powered by Socrata. You can get to it most easily. You can just Google, you can search or whatever your preferred search engine is, or you can go to nyc.gov data. I usually do that because it's shorter. Yeah, yeah. So the 
how do you get thousands of data sets updated, uploaded, updated, kept up to date, adequately described, stuff like that? How do you do that across uh, like tens of agencies, commissions, things like that? So you have to have into you have to have individuals responsible for it. And here, the open data law specifies that you have to have open data coordinators in each of these. And that's their job. They review the open data, they review data sets for whether they should be published. They specify practices for updating them and so on. All right, so we've learned about some of the history of open data and what open data is, but how do we access it? As mentioned, we have this portal. So if you go to nyc.gov slash open data, or if you search for that, you'll be brought to this page. Um, so we're gonna explore this and learn more about how to actually navigate this page and how to pull data from it that you can use. So to start, we have this search bar. So if you come onto the site and you have an idea in your head of what you're looking for, you can just go in and search for a certain data set specifically, but you might not know what you're looking for. So at the top of the page, you're gonna see this data box. So if we click here, that's gonna bring us to this nice navigation page. The way I like to view this is like my seamless little hub. Maybe I'm not sure what I'm in the mood for dinner that night. Maybe I don't know what data set I want, but we have a lot of options. So we can navigate them by agency. Maybe I want to look at what the DOT is collecting, right? I can look at categories, so business, city government, et cetera. Or maybe I want to see what's popular. What are other people looking at? What's a hot new data set out there? That's going to be the place to go. Or we can see what's new. So there's new data sets being added constantly. I don't, I don't have an exact number for that, but you can come here and see new sets of data that are regularly added or updated. And it's really interesting. Every time I come on here, there's a new data set that I've never been aware of before. Even this morning, I spoke to somebody who told me about a data set of rats in New York City, which I don't know if I wanted to know about that, but it exists and you can find that on here. So there's a lot of interesting things you may or may not be aware of that you can explore. So we're going to go through an example of pulling up a data set. So in this slide, um, we're back on that home page where we have our search bar, and we're going to be looking up a 311 data. If you're not aware of 311, um, 311 um, is New York City government resource for assistance and general in information outside of emergency situations. So it's an emergency, you'd be calling 911, everything else you'd be calling 311. And they're open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and they're available in over 175 languages for roughly 3,600 government services. So they're collecting a lot of points of data and they're accessible in many different ways. The way I had always heard of them was via phone, you'd call 311, but through this training, I learned you can actually reach them through web, Skype, Twitter, Facebook, um, they have an app. So they're collecting data in many different ways from many different people. So once I typed in 311, hit enter, I got all the, the search returned um, 43 results of 311 data sets. So we're going to explore this first one here, 311 service requests from 2010 to present. And once I open that, I'm just going to go back. So when you click the title of it, it'll bring you to this kind of about page. And on here, we can really just learn more about the data set. And each data set's going to be a little bit different. They're not all collect, the data's not all collected in the same way. Each agency does different and unique things. So you always want to start here and figure out what we're looking at before we really dive into it. So some key things to note. At the bottom, we have what's in this data set. Just to get like a good overview, we're going to quickly learn there's 27.5 million rows of data. So that's a lot. And each row of data is going to be a service request. So a request that somebody put in with 311. And then some important things to note before we dive in are when was this when was this data set last updated? These slides were made back in January, so likely the most likely thing is that this data set is more up to date now, but at this point in time the last date it was updated was January 11th, 2022, and the frequency that is updated is daily. So if we looked at this live on the internet right now, that would be updated to the 4th most likely unless they're backdated a bit. And then you can see how many views and downloads this has. So a lot of people are accessing this data, over 400,000 views and downloads. And the next thing we're going to explore a bit more, you'll see on this page is a data dictionary. So this is going to be a link, and it's going to take us to a beautiful data dictionary. Um, and if you're not familiar with a data dictionary, this is going to be breaking down what your data in your data set is. So this column name is telling you what all of the columns in your data set are. And then the description is going to actually describe what, what that means. And it seems straightforward, but a lot of times these column names aren't as 
um, obvious as you might think they are. You might just have the wrong information in your head. Sometimes I'll see create a date and maybe I think that's when the data set was created, but it's actually when something else was created. So you should always just go through and review that. Do you know what you're working with later on? And it's important to note here, this one's really thorough and it's really nice. Not all the data dictionaries are going to be the same. If you come into one and you maybe still have some questions, there's a page on the open data portal where you can ask for assistance or help. And you can always put in a request to maybe get some more information if there's anything you're unclear about. Because really the most important thing is understanding the data you're working with. Otherwise, you might come to the wrong conclusions later down the road. Yes. Just uh, like uh, one, one example of why this might be useful. If you look there on row nine, that's the status. It shows some the list of expected values. So this is really useful information if you are, say, trying to filter and don't want to just dig through the actual data set values to see what uh, a field values a field can take. Not all data dictionaries have it, but they're uh, in the process of enhancing them, improving them so that uh, they'll be able to uh, be used in that kind of way. Right. Yeah, so once you have a good understanding, I'm going to go back to the previous page, the about page, and let's actually take a look at that data. At the top of this page, you'll have a few options. Um, we're going to start with the one that's boxed, the view data option, and we'll go back to that slide in a second. Um, when I load my data, we're just going to come to a, a table and like we learned earlier, there's millions of rows of data. There's many columns. We're not seeing all of them here. So this is a lot to work with. So we're going to filter our data, and we're going to make this a more manageable size. That way we can not be just overwhelmed with millions of rows of data. So on the right-hand side, you'll see it's already highlighted. We have this filter button. So when I click, that's going to allow me to just break down this data a bit. So in this example, we're going to, sorry, bear with me. We're going to go to this filter box and we're going to set a little query here. So in this example, we're taking community board and we're making that equal to Queen's community board one. So this is going to take my 27 million, million rows of data and reduce it just to rows that occurred in Queen's CV1. And when we did that, you'll see that our results went from millions to now 500,000. So it's still a lot, but it's something a little bit more manageable. And what's pretty cool is you can add multiple conditions here. So our QB1 was a basic example. There's other um, parameters we can add in. So we've added in two additional ones. We've added a created date is after and put in January 1st as our timestamp. And then we added an agency field. So this will now narrow it down to results that were created after January 1st and anyone that fell into the jurisdiction of the DSNY. And when we did that, I think we now have a nice number of 289 results. Um, it's a little small, but that's a more manageable number. And now we can actually do some analysis from here. So now that we have this, go back. So now that we have this filtered data, there's a few things we can do with it. So we're gonna come here. The a really simple one that you can always start with is just simply exporting that data. So we have this table of filtered data. I want to export it and just put it on my own computer and do my own analysis from there. If I click that export tab, you'll see we have a few different formats such as CSV, JSON, et cetera. You can select which one you're interested in and export your data from there. And then you can do whatever you want with it. I can put it in Excel, do some fun things in there. I can put it into any visualization tool. The world is your oyster. But what's really cool, say we don't want to do this on our own computer, in our own framework. This portal also allows us to visualize the data directly on the site. And this is a really really cool and powerful tool. So if we jump back to that original about page for this data set, you'll see we have this visualize button. Um, if you click that, it'll bring you to a visualization tool directly on the NYC open portal, open data portal. And this is really powerful. It's similar to Tableau or all this other software, which is normally really expensive. And this is all available for you just to use open to the public. So we're going to just do a quick example with that same 311 data set. So in this example, we're going to start. And you'll see at the top, we have this box. This allows you to choose how you'd like to visualize your data. So in this example, we have this little pie box selected. So we're making a pie chart. And you'll see that there's a lot of examples that we have row and bar charts and some scatter plot a globe. So we can make some fun maps later on. So here we're doing a pie chart. And we're again just filtering that data. So we're going to look at any service requests that came in on March 21st 
2021. And then we're going to aggregate that data. So on the left, we have some ways to break down our data. So it's visually makes sense to us. So in this case, we're going to aggregate the data by borough and we're going to be looking at a count of records by borough. So we'll, we start to see where are the most requests coming from in this time frame. So you'll see Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan all have a lot of requests coming in here. And so if we go back, like I mentioned before, at the top, we have a few different ways we can visualize data. This is probably my favorite, but we have this map at the top. And this allows you to plot um, your data. So if your data has a spatial ties to any spatial data in it, we'll be able to plot it on a map. So in this case, we're looking at records that were created um, yesterday, which would have been jack back in January at this point. And we're just simply plotting each record. So where did, where was that request coming from? And so you can see a nice distribution of where people are submitting 311 requests throughout the city. And again, this is all, all available for you on the website, which is really cool. And the last example we'll do here is we're just looking at a bar chart set up the same way we selected the type of visualization we wanted at the top. We added a filter for requests that were going through the DOT and we added a time frame. And then here on the left, we have it aggregated by complaint type. So we have how many complaints are coming in for each type of request that the 311 center gets. And so here we can see that our top request at this time was street conditions. So something was going on with the streets at that time. All right, sorry for jumping through a bit. So there's other visualization tools you can explore here. Um, I recommend everyone check it out. It's really fun to just play around and see what you can do here. And if you're ever in need of some inspiration or just looking to explore more, on the Open Data site, there's a project gallery with different online tools that other people have made, all using open data from this portal. So you can navigate to this, and I'm not gonna go back to it, but if we, the link's right there at the top, but you can navigate to this from the Open Data site as well. There's a selection at the top of the page. And this is really cool just to get like your creative juices flowing. There's a lot of really interesting ones. The Squirrel's Tales one is definitely recommend checking that one. There was a squirrel census done and you can see where all these squirrels live in, in the park and what they're up to. And if you ever use this data and create a tool that you think might be useful for others, you can submit it. There's a few requirements, but you can submit it to the open data site and your tool can be published here as well. In addition to that, we there also exists a collection of maps so the URL is at the top, nyc.gov slash map. And this is very similar. Um, these are created by city agencies, though. And it's just another way to make this data more accessible to the public. And there's a lot of really neat ones you can explore. These are a few examples. One that I like is a map of snow plows and the progress that they're making throughout the city. It's pretty useful. And again, that's all just made with data that is publicly available. Yeah, one of my favorite of those visualizations, just to briefly hack back, is it's, it's dark, but like, with Vision Zero, like the, I believe the police department publishes information on each vehicle crash and like the type of vehicle, where it occurred. And mapping those can help identify like where hotspots are, where additional enforcement or might be needed, stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. That one's, what's it called? It is called the NYC Crash Mapper. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's, but yeah, yeah, you can find that and a whole bunch of others on that. So it's the fire hose, right? Like. <laughs> Where do you get started? Uh, a lot of the time, as just mentioned, you can just explore, look at what data sets are there. Other times you might come in with some problem that you want to solve and you want to see how open data could be applicable to helping you solve it in an informed way. Uh, so we're offering this framework as just a rubric to help with that kind of exploration or that kind of uh, inquiry. For the more exploratory stuff, like you get into the world of research, how do you even find a question is, can be a very involved activity, but yeah. So for when you actually have a problem, then you can take a bit more of a pragmatic. As you can see here, we have just five, five categories or steps or like stages for solving a problem with open data. And we're gonna go through an example of that, but before I do that, it's a, uh, no, I could just continue. Yeah. So here we have this scenario. You're working for an agency that wants to support restaurants specifically by giving them money, small grants and loans. And the question, first question you're interested in is who should you give money to? Which restaurants exist? Which restaurants uh, need funding? Stuff like that. So here 
This corresponds to the stage of defining the problem and understanding the stakeholders. When you have done that, when you say, I want to, I'm interested in restaurants, I'm interested in restaurants maybe in some specific region, I'm uh, interested in restaurants that may need assistance, the it, it's, it can be time to start looking for data sets. This is also somewhat exploratory to figure out what data sets on the open data platform are applicable to your problem. One way to do that could be to just search. Do you have any guesses? Anyone have a guess what you might find? What's an interesting data set about restaurants? Uh, those are good answers. So you might want to say limit assistance to restaurants that have good ratings or bad ratings if they need more assistance. So it's it's certainly something you could explore. You By searching for related keywords like businesses and restaurants, you'll get a bunch of interesting ones, like applications for opening restaurants is possibly interesting. And you can see here, there's a bunch of interesting, relevant data sets. And there's the open restaurants inspections, like you mentioned right there, the third one on that list. Based on the data that's available, you might next proceed to more specific questions that you can answer using the data that help you refine your approach. So that first one it related to ratings, what uh, restaurants got an A rating in the last year? Which ones have already received support, in this case, as part of a business acceleration program? Which ones are the largest employers? Which ones are heavily trafficked areas? And these are actually all questions that you can find information about, answer in ways that you have to be careful about, as we'll see later, using open data data sets. So that's very, like, to elaborate on that last one, if you're looking at the business acceleration program, which from the overview sounds like it might be closely related to what you're interested in. If you dig into the data set information and the detailed description, uh, the data dictionary, you can see that it actually doesn't quite correspond. You're not reproducing the work that this other program already uh, is doing. This one only provides in-kind support as opposed to grants and loans. If a data dictionary isn't enough to tell you whether the contents of a data set are applicable to your question, then that contact us link on pretty much every NYC Open Data page takes you to the help desk where NYC Open Data staff will find the answer to your question. Uh, it can take some time, but generally you can expect it to be within days to two weeks. Continuing to the inspections, we might be interested in restaurants that are receiving A ratings like we had asked earlier. So. Digging into the data dictionary, we can find out who the business is, what kinds of violations they've had, and what their overall grades are. The data dictionary tells us what those fields mean in some ways. You can see here that, for example, this, oh, no, this is not the data, this is up columns in the data set page. So next to you, once you've identified columns that might be interesting, you go to the data dictionary. And you would, for example, using the visualization tool, you could plot the kinds of complaints that were common. So here you can see that the most common category for compliance here in the Bronx is that they simply skipped. Generally, you want to summarize the data rather than just looking at the raw rows in some fashion. And the two most consumable ways tend to be tables and charts. Tables don't necessarily get enough love, in my opinion. I think they're really information dense, but Charts, like the picture can be worth a thousand words. Some pictures are worth more, some less, but a good visualization can also convey the information to your stakeholders in a really concise, rapid way. Visual processing is much faster than reading. Returning to the uh, question at hand, uh, another visualization you can use here, you can see is uh, actually plotting the ratings. And now you find to your dismay that the majority of restaurants simply don't have a rating. This is one of the reasons you want to examine the data, see what's actually there, look at the data dictionary, uh, stuff like that, because you don't want surprises like this to completely undermine your analysis. With that information, you probably would not want to use ratings as one of the inputs, simply because they're missing for most of the cases, or not most, or a plurality of the cases. Yeah, at, like I said, once you have analyses, you can provide recommendations, you can provide information, or if you're the decision maker, you can make the decision yourself. With that information, you probably would not want to use ratings as one of the inputs, simply because they're missing for most of the cases, or not most, or a plurality of the cases. Yeah, like I said, civic technologists and the like. And 
if you're interested in data that isn't already public, you can request it, again, via the Contact Us page. If you, like, if you want to see what other people have done, you can look at the Open Data Project Gallery. If you've made your own, you can submit your projects to the Open Data Project Gallery. And you're all here. You're all here for the School of Data, which is kind of the, one of the culminating events of uh, Open Data Week, the celebration of the anniversary of the Open Data Law. Uh, there's a lot of other events uh, that, have, that have been part of Open Data Week, everything from data-oriented art to other NGOs to seminars. A lot of good stuff. Open Data Week, you're all here. Any questions? One other thing I'll add is we're both part of a volunteer program to where we learned about this and shared it with and we're going to share, continue sharing with the public, and they do cohorts every year where you get trained and then give similar presentation. If that's of interest, you can always get involved that way as well. I want to add that. Joint events the entire week. Today, there, there's the kickoff today and then events through Sunday the 13th. Uh, for the and if you want to join the Open Data Ambassadors program and become an Open Data Ambassador yourself, like Laura and Natarajan, you can visit nyc.gov slash teach open data. All right. Well, thank you all for attending. I hope you find this interesting, informative, and enjoyable. I'm a writer. So uh, I wrote a short story about it. And in the short story, the squirrels come down from the trees and attack all the human population. And a dog in a store saves her owner. So when the squirrels in the story come down, attack it. I needed to know how many squirrels that would be. Is it like one per person? And I had no idea. So I started asking around and it turns out that nobody had a supervision. So with uh, Stuart about it and I said, we should count squirrels in our neighborhood. And uh, he's, instead of saying that's a ridiculous idea, he said, yeah, I wonder how we would do that. So we started forming a team in Inman Park, our Cartago. It turns out there was a, a squirrel scientist at Emory University that uh, had information on how you actually go out and count squirrels. And then we uh, came across a wildland firefighter who uh, knew how to map things and, uh, and organize large groups of people. And so 10 years ago, we um, went out and uh, counted squirrels in Inman Park, which is a neighborhood in Atlanta, one of the uh, Atlanta's uh, first suburban settlement. It's a bunch of old growth oak trees. It was where I lived. And so we went out and counted squirrels and we counted squirrels and presented our findings to the public and we got, we put it on Kickstarter and we became a Kickstarter project of the year. And so it took off from there. Since we counted squirrels in Inman Park one other time. And then in 2018, we counted the squirrels in Central Park. And I'm going to talk to you about how we did that and the data that we gathered on there. So basically, in this presentation, what we're going to do is just talk about, uh, we, we can skip over the why. We can talk about the why when we do the uh, question and answer at the end. We can talk about the how and then the what. The what is the product that uh, we create from all this. So I will just jump into the, the how right away. Does anybody have any guesses on how you go about counting squirrels in an urban green space? Throw out an idea. What's that? Internet survey. Yeah. All right. Surprising number of people said paintballs. Hey, you paintball school, uh, which if you think about it, doesn't really work out. Name Von Flieger, who was the, as you can see there, International Squirrel Authority. He made his career studying the Eastern Gray Squirrel, and he came up with a methodology and formula for counting squirrels. And the simple way to explain it is so if you have a park like Central Park, you break down the park into hectares. A hectare is roughly two acres. Central Park has 350 hectares. Then you uh, get squirrel ciders together, volunteer squirrel ciders, and you uh, send them out into the park and they each get assigned a hectare and they spend 20 to 25 minutes counting squirrels in that hectare. You count the hectares twice. So you get a good count in the morning and then you get a good count in the late afternoon. And then you uh, plug it into a formula that Mr. Von Flieger came up with, and it spits out a squirrel abundance number for the park, and which is supposed to be pretty as accurate as you're going to get without actually counting every single squirrel, tagging every single squirrel, tra trapping them. Um, 
So that's the basic gist of it. And so what happens is when you send out, for as an example, Central Park, uh, we had 323 volunteer squirrel ciders and we sent out people into the park. So we did over 700 counts. And while they were in the park, they gathered data, not just on the squirrels, but on the park. So this is a, the, the tally sheet that we used uh, for the Central Park count. As you can see, we have... Uh, so you would show up into your hectare, right? Your assigned hectare, and you'd start writing down the park conditions, whether it's calm or busy or something else. Other animals that you might cite, litter, dogs were prevalent in, in I think, almost every hectare of the park. Litter, temperature and weather, the date, that kind of thing. And then you'd go about citing squirrels. So people would see a wander around and you see a squirrel and whether it's gray or black or cinnamon, highlight the fur colors. If it's on the ground plane or above ground, a lot of times it was both. If squirrels run up and down trees, other activities, interactions with humans and other notes or observations. We also included a map of the area so that people could pinpoint the location of the squirrel in the park. And then uh, we were able to create, I'll show you here. <clears throat> these two maps of Central Park. So the data that we gathered was, it, it had never been done before. The Central Park has been mapped a number of different times, but no one's ever mapped it from the squirrel's perspective. And so it was like, because you had to get really detailed with it. So this map could blow up to be nine feet long. We blew it up to, to five feet, but it's the most comprehensive map of Central Park that's ever been created. And within that, we also created a second map which is the squirrel's perspective of Central Park. And all those little dots, constellations of dots, uh, are squirrels and squirrel sightings. And each one has a certain color around it. And, and the key on the map at the top, it tells you what color the squirrel was, what the squirrel was doing, and other associated information. And yeah, I can see how you would do a head there on the map. But how would people know in practice when they went to the park where the boundaries of their head there was? Because yeah. it's quite a big area. Yeah. It's quite big. And the topography of Central Park is very. That's a good question. Yeah. So we had to, again, we had to map the park beforehand. And so when they were presented with a tally sheet, the tally sheet would have the where they could count squirrel. And then if you flipped it over, it had the map of the actual area with like details on it. So you would see like, there, it starts with, say, there's a basketball court right there, like the core of the basketball court. And then you can, we told volunteers, to your hectare, stand in one corner of it, and then, then visualize it. And you can see the other landmarks out there that can show you the boundaries of the, of the hectare. And people ask you to count the same squirrel twice. Yeah, we, that's part of the point. Because they would run. Uh, they could jump over. Yeah, they don't know the hectare is there, so they're running. So that's what we did in Central Park. And we released this data. So what we, basically we um, present our findings to the public. And we do so in fun and engaging ways. So the Central Park Squirrel Census uh, full report of 2019 included the five foot long, it included a squirrel supplemental, which is 37 pages of squirrel content, extra squirrel content and observations about squirrels. Um, it also included a 45 RPM record, which was basically, we took all the best notes from squirrel census, uh, squirrel ciders, and we had people record them. So they would record what the, the notes were saying. And then we put it over a, uh, a soundtrack and I can show you here. So this would be. So it's an experiential version of the park and an audio experience of the park. And so that was one of the things that we presented and we did that. And the reason that we do use things like this as we want, it's not just to count squirrels and figure out how many squirrels are out there. It's, it's the same reason that the census of the United States, for instance, when you do a census of the United States, you're not just counting people, you're gathering information that creates a profile of what, what the country is like right now and what needs might have. And the same thing can be said if you do a census of Central Park. You can count the squirrels, but then you gather other information and then you can see, you get a, a generalized profile of the actual green space and, and whether or not it has certain needs, whether uh, there are certain parts that are overcrowded with squirrels or other 
parts that have no squirrels. And when you have no squirrels, then you don't have diversity of wildlife because they're acting as predators. So there's a n- number of reasons that we found just by doing this why we count squirrels. Um, so the how, does everybody understand the how we do that? Okay. What? So I'm going to give you an example of the different things that we've created with the data. The Central Park, this was our first website in 2012. And so we basically uh, took the data and explained to people what we were doing. And then we came up with, uh, this is the first map that we created. This is uh, MM Park and you can see the squirrel sightings on it. I live right there. Yeah. That's the Carter Center. So we presented it with that map and Our cartographer, Nat Slaughter, also came up with data visualization. That's every single squirrel sighted. And the key at the bottom shows whether it's a juvenile or an adult squirrel, what activities it was doing, and so on. So if you look at it, it becomes like the matrix. The ones and zeros become squirrels. And then we created a map. This is a rough map of Central Park, or sorry, uh, Inman Park, and the uh, cider comments inside each one. So you could read what was going on in the park at the time. And then why count squirrels? Why I'm in park? We did squirrel audio, squirrel shop, how it worked, some photographs and so forth. All right. We got such a good response that we wanted to do it again. And so we, in 2016, we released our second count of squirrels and the Inman Park Squirrel Census. And this particular one, we created a report, a print report that unfolds and includes a map of Inman Park, again, with squirrel sighted, but it it includes data visualizations along the way. And in this particular presentation of the data, we started to get a little more experimental. We started um, adding in anthropomorph stories, which scientists sometimes frown upon, but we figured we're citizen scientists, so we're going to go ahead and have fun with this. So we created anthropomorphic characters and use that to tell the Inman Park squirrel story. Uh, a bit further. We constantly have to tell people that this is real, that we're actually doing this. And let's see. So that was the second one. And now uh, the third one was, as I mentioned, the Central Park Squirrel Census, which was the most intensive one. There's the report and you can see the squirrel sightings. Let's see. And then in March, on March 1st, 2020, as part of NYC Open Data, we organized uh, a casual count of squirrels in 24 parks across the city. And it was essentially designed to give people the experience of counting squirrels and what that would be like. And so it wasn't trying to come up with the squirrel abundance number of each park, but just give people the sense. And so what we ended up having was tons of data and, um, and stories about uh, New York City parks. And so we were trying to figure out how we were going to present it. And we thought about doing the map thing again, but that just didn't seem to, we'd done it so many times that we wanted to try something new. So we came up with a different way to present the data and that's the um, 1-800 phone tree. So if you call that number, you can, you know, basically if you, you know, call Visa on the 1-800 number and you go press one for this, press two for that. This is all about squirrels and the data. So it's, if you like squirrels, press one. And if you don't, then you just hang up. And uh, so it, it was a really rewarding way to present the data. What we did was eventually you drill down enough to where you can pick which park you want to hear data about. And so if it's like Corlear's hook park, you push that button and someone reads the data. And before they read the data, Charlie, our New York city intern went out to each of these parks and he recorded sounds from them. So he, and he introduced it, he said, hello, welcome to Washington Square Park. And then you would just hear sounds from around the area. And then the person would start reading the data over that. Because we couldn't just do that. And because we, we like to have lots of fun, we also included a squirrel song called Tiny Little Squirrel. So you can hear a squirrel song. Fortunes, uh, jokes. What else is on there? Oh yeah, there's a, we, when we were going to uh, count squirrels in 2020, we wanted mimes to be involved. We wanted people to go out to the park and then there would be a mime in the park. We wouldn't tell them that there was a mime, but the mime would be looking out for the squirrel counters. And we wanted the mime to interact with them in some way and then see just a little social experiment to see if they would write it down. So we called the mimes. There's a couple of different mime organizations in New York and they wanted to charge us $250 an hour 
to, to go out there times 25 hours. And I was like, well, this is a volunteer effort. We can't do that. Can't you just go out there and do it? So long story short, we get revenge on the vines with the, the phone tree. We have people read the data and then there's a button where you can go to hear a mime interpret this data. Mine so many. So we, it's 30 seconds of silence. And then there's other school stories and stuff on there too. Um, we have sponsors for this kind of thing. A lot of people ask us, how do you pay for this? Sponsors. We had, I don't know if you guys are familiar with MailChimp. They, they supported us for years. And then we have some other sponsors this year. We went local. Gene Kansas is a commercial real estate guy that's doing good things in Atlanta. Rosie's Roofing is an Atlanta roofer. They gave us some money. And then Constellations is a shared workspace in Atlanta. They gave us some money just to, because they believe in art and doing cool things. And so they promote that kind of stuff. Do you have any questions so far? Just about methodology. You said that accounts go into a formula, which you know, spits out estimated abundance. Are there other inputs other than accounts that go into that formula, like about the topography or anything? Like about the topography or? No, it's, it's strictly the, yeah, the squirrel counts. And then, the, yeah, within the, so our squirrel scientist, who can explain this a lot better than I can, um, he, the formula allows you to adjust it so that Generally, if a person goes into a hectare, it's, it's acknowledged that they're seeing about 60% of the squirrels that are in that hectare. If two people count the hectare though, that number goes up to 70 or 80 or any, he also factors in the time of day and the weather because squirrels are more active in certain types of weather. So he went through each of the 350 uh, hectares in Central Park and adjusted it based on the conditions and the number of ciders to get the most accurate number. Yeah. And how consistent were the count, counts? Like if, if two people counted the same hectare. It, how consistent? Yeah. Like between like morning and. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, sometimes it varied wildly. And so that, that was one thing we had to keep an eye on when we were doing the counts because you can start to know where the squirrels are in a park. And that, for instance, in the Ram, it's like squirrel haven. There. And you need to get a, a pretty good count. You need to, they need to come back with a good number of squirrels in their particular hectare. Otherwise you go, maybe that wasn't that great of a count. So we sent someone to yeah. And then, but then if you like are counting in a sheep's meadow, there's no squirrels there because there's no trees. It's right in the middle. So people would go there and, oh, I got a sheep meadow. And they'd be like, you see that squirrel. Yeah. All of the data, by the way, from the central park count is available on NYC open data. Let's see here. Yeah. NYC open data, you can download it. It's uh, separated into park data, squirrel data, and stories. And people have downloaded it. You can see it's, it's been viewed 65,000 times and downloaded 26,000 times. And so people have come up with their own data visualization with the data that we've used. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna ask, what are people doing with the data? Do you notice like parks? department or anyone being in an interesting way? It's mostly people have fun with it. Like that it's out of his people who like have been looking for data sets that are solid and, and then play with it. And it's fun to us because we, when you present, you have all of this information and you present the data, you have to make a lot of choices and you have to cut out a lot of things. And this allows us to just give them all the information and then we see what they focus. And so a few people focused on, um, the black squirrel population in Central Park, which these are gray squirrels, but they just have, uh, just have black fur. And then there's certain squirrels with like black fur, but then cinnamon tails in certain areas. And just noting the pattern of that. Uh, and then, and, and from what I understand, uh, the black squirrel population has increased over the last uh, 15, 20 years. And so it's seeing where they're, where they come in and where they're actually, they're, they, there's more of them in the North and they've been heading steadily south. And so it'd be interesting to see what, what that turns into in the next 10 years or so. The other thing about Central Park is that a lot of researchers and scientists were excited to see the data because Central Park is essentially an island for squirrels and it's, they can try and get off, but it's, there's no other nearby parks. And so they have to stay there. And so there's a theory that uh, they're evolving in their own way and that more tests should be done on that type of thing and see how they're to live in these city squirrels, basically. Some other patterns that we noticed were um, in the southern part of the park, squirrels 
where they would approach you more because that's where a lot of the tourists come in and then they feed the squirrels. And so the squirrels saw humans as a food source. And then in the northern parts of the park where there's less, the squirrels are basically like humans are not a food source. They're a predator, a danger. And so they would, they would st stay away from humans. But again, you can go on NYC Open Data and just have all kinds of fun with it. Here, watch this. This is an example of what the data set looks like. So these are, this is squirrels. So it's like an adult squirrel or a juvenile squirrel. Cinnamon color was the main color. Then the secondary colors is on the ground plane. And then other, whether it approaches or is different. Tail twitching, tail flags. We had people record when they heard cucks, claws, and moans. Those are the three uh, main squirrel sounds. And we had, to, we had to teach people what the cucks, and claws, and moans were. It sounded like, yeah. So there's all that kind of stuff. And yeah. You said it's 2018. Have you done it since then, or do you do it continuously, or did you just do it this once? Yeah, we just did it once, and people want us to do it every year, like a marathon or five k or something like that. And it, the reason that we don't is because it it is so much work. Like it's it's a full time job when we do it. And the squirrel census team is all a bunch of perfectionists, and so we're gonna create a map that can't just be like a casual map. It has to be the best map ever created of Central Park. <laughs> and you know, the writing and the, we're not just gonna, we're actually considering what we're gonna do next. Assuming we, we would get sponsorship, one idea is to go to Hyde Park in London. And, and then there's two other parks right near it and count those parks, which that total area is smaller than Central Park, so it would be, but the interesting thing is that Eastern Gray Squirrels are everywhere in Hyde Park, but they're not native to uh, Great Britain. And they've actually pushed out the, the native red squirrel. And uh, some say decimated the red squirrel population because they outcompete red squirrels and they carry a parapox virus that they're immune to, but that the red squirrel is not immune to. And so now you can type in red squirrel population, red versus gray, and, and like seven different websites come up and they map the locations of the gray squirrels versus red squirrels and some people take it very seriously so going over there to shed light on that might be a, a fun project for us to do we have the one volunteer here judy garza who she helped not only helped us take all of the data that we collected and type it into our spreadsheets but she was actually out counting squirrels for us and you've had some good experiences with that what is it like to go out and actually count squirrels it was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, I found out about it. Actually, uh, a friend in Minnesota who knew we liked squirrels had seen uh, something about it and emailed me and said, are you going to be doing this? And so, of course, I immediately had to Google and find out what was going on. But it was also a great way to learn about the park. Your question about how you knew where the hectares were in your area, it was actually pretty obvious. Uh, the, the maps were really good. And as, as Jamie said, what you do is you start at one and go in very systematically. So we were given really good instruction how to do it. The data collection seemed to be very good, very thorough. But like I said, it was just a lot of fun finding parts of the park that you never go into and paying attention. One of the things that I do with other parts of my life are give tours, and I'm always telling my people, Look, everybody's so on their phones or whatever, people are not looking. And this forces you to look. And so it was just, it was a great experience. The, the hectares that people count are generated random, so they don't get to pick where they go. And which is probably better for them because they probably picked something familiar. And that wouldn't, that wouldn't give them the experience uh, that they get when they have to go someplace see a new part of the park. Yeah, we get yeah, David. Oh, I also was a, a volunteer. And I have to say that the squirrels are really pretty smart because they allow dogs to go without leash until nine o'clock in the morning in Central Park, and then they're supposed to be on a leash. And really at 901, you can see the squirrels streaming down from the trees because they know the dogs are not going to chase them. And as we already said, there are certain parts of the park where they really congregate. So if I did a count by Tavern on the Green, and the squirrels know that there's 
a lot of uh, leftover food in the in the trash bins, and they're they're in the morning going through pulling stuff. So it really depends on what part of the park you're in. When we started doing this, again, it's just like we're learning as we go, and we realized that no one really had any idea like what is a healthy number of squirrels. So like the squirrel abundance number, what's healthy, and what we found. When we counted in park, there was the first time we did it, I think there was roughly 5.78 squirrels per hectare. And we thought, okay, that's interesting. And then we counted it again to check our numbers to, a couple years later, and it was 6.14 squirrels per hectare. And squirrel populations go up and down, but that seemed to be like, okay, like that seems to be like a healthy number of squirrels. So then when we came to Central Park, we were curious what it would be, and it, was, it turned out to be 6.78 squirrels per hectare. So you start to find, oh, that's a healthy number. It seems like a healthy number of squirrels. It's like Central Park is a healthy park. Uh, it has a lot of diverse wildlife and it has some different types of tree canopies. There's tree canopies covering much of the park. And then there's other areas that are wide open. And, and so even though that particular park is different than park down in way down in Atlanta, the numbers are very similar on the squirrel buttons. Number. So I thought that was interesting. The more we do this, the more we know. So it's more interesting. Uh, yeah, so there's a, a lot of cool things that, again, the squirrels seeing humans as a food source and close to the entrances of the parks and then competing with pigeons and, and then in the northern regions of the park that see the uh, one thing we, you would, every once in a while, someone would see a, a bird of prey that would be going after the squirrels. And the interesting thing about it was that, um, they, you would think that the squirrels would like see it, something that was going to kill them and would run and hide in, in their nest. It wouldn't, they just stay out there and just kind of be annoyed by it. And then John in during our 2020 count at Marcus Garvey park, witness had took video of it, witnessed this incredible fight. Uh, a hawk was in a tree and like what? 10 squirrels. And the squirrels are taking turns, like Mission Impossible, climbing underneath the branch to then bat at the hawk and run away. <laughs> All the other squirrels are screaming encouragement from the safety of the trap. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was marvelous. Like, the videos are on their Instagram. It's, it's, I've never seen anything like that. And I grew up in the city. And yeah, it's life changing. <laughs> there is a, a lot of drama in the trees if you just stop to look up. That's one thing that I learned from it is that I didn't really know much about squirrels at all. And then just started looking, you started looking at them, constant drama going on, they're fighting each other, they're fighting against birds, they're ha having to deal with cars, the city life, all that kind of stuff. It's kind of interesting. Look, and their Atlas Obscura did a, a podcast last year. You guys heard of the white squirrel in Prospect Park? There's a white, one white squirrel in Prospect Park and it attracts a lot of attention to people. So they went out to find it, they found it. Um, and that's essentially the, the theme of that particular podcast. I recommend listening to it. Is that just take a moment to stop.